guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the podcast. Today, I'm really happy to have Graham Wardle back on the show. Graham is an extremely intelligent man, and he has so much wisdom and knowledge to share. And I think that there's a great opportunity for everyone to be able to learn something from him, uh, no matter where he shares um, other podcasts, his own podcast um, interviews he's, he does. Um, if you listen to what he shares with an open mind and an open heart, there's so much benefit from it that you can take and integrate into your own life. And so I always enjoy talking to him because I always walk away from a conversation with Graham having learned something new about myself, something new about the world, or, you know, just, you know, something new to take away and to contemplate or to give thought to. And so that's something that I really respect and appreciate about getting the opportunity to talk to Graham. So I hope that you guys really enjoy this. Um, Graham also has a new poetry book out, The Time Has Come. And that is available on Amazon for anyone who does not have a copy of the book and wants to check that out. You can do that there. And he also has the Time Has Come Network where he um, supports people on their journey of stepping out on the comfort zone. And he does offer a free month to anyone who would like to check it out and see what it's about, see if it works for them. So um, I have included the links for those things for anyone who would like to check out his book or his network in the show notes. So um, you guys can check that out there. I also have a um, podcast guest playlist on Spotify, where I have guests come in and share some music so that people can kind of get a feel for them and uh, have a variety of music to enjoy. So um, Graham was really kind and he created a um, guest playlist uh, for this episode. And I have included those songs that he shared into the podcast guest playlist on Spotify and that link is in my link tree. But I also broke out um, the link for his podcast guest playlist that he shared uh, for the guests of this show today. So if you just want to check out his music, you can do that as well. Um, that is also included on the links. I separated that one from the guest playlist. So you just click on there and you'll see it. Um, and if you want to head over to Instagram, I also have a giveaway um, of some sign stuff that I have of Grams that I want to share with everyone. So if you want to be a part of that, please head over to the link in my link tree. Um, it'll take you over to the Instagram and you can enter to win. It's open worldwide for everyone to have the opportunity. And I hope that you guys all really enjoy this episode. I hope that you learn something new. I hope that you get a lot out of it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your feedback. So without further ado, Welcome to the Power Within Podcast. I'm your host, Lori, and today I'm really happy to have Graham Wardle back on the show. Graham, thank you so much for being here again. Thanks for having me, Lori. I'm excited to chat with you once again. So I want to go back a bit. So I know that homeschooling right now is a really big um, thing that's starting to come back. And I know that you and your siblings were homeschooled when you were younger. So I want to know what that experience was like for you. And I also would like to know what was the most beneficial thing that has carried over into your adult life that you learned from that experience? Oh, cool. Okay. So, yeah, I was homeschooled till ooh, when I was, I think I went to public school in grade six. Uh, and homeschooling taught me a lot about myself and how I like to learn. So what I loved about homeschooling was I got to learn at my own pace and I could progress as fast as I could. There was no like, oh, the class is at this page in the book. You can't go any further, which is what happened when I got to public school. My math teacher said, no, we're just doing this. And I was like, well, I was already at, a, I think, a grade eight or something level math. And my teacher's like, no, we're on this lesson. You have to stay here. And it was it was kind of frustrating and kind of uh, mind boggling to me. Like, why can't I keep learning? Like, why do I have to wait? But it was... That was a structure of a public school. Everybody has to be on the same lesson uh, to keep everybody moving forward at the same pace. Uh, so that was challenging for me. So the, the biggest insight that I got was, and I've told my parents this, being homeschooled up until grade six was like this sort of like interesting period then to make the switch because I had just enough of the experience of learning at my own pace, kind of exploring the world on my own, and then switching to the public school where I was kind of thrust into this new form of learning and social dynamics. 
that it kind of gave me a taste of both worlds where I wasn't completely like the homeschool type stereotype kid. <laughs> and I wasn't a public school kid. I was somewhere in the in this middle mixing zone. And so it gave me this perspective of life where I'm very grateful to be able to see the benefits of both sides of this. And that's kind of how I, I try and look at life when I disagree with someone or when I have a different life path than someone else, I go, okay, well, how can I see the benefits of their journey? How can I learn from them and what they've gone through? And then try and find the common themes. I've always been fascinated with patterns and metaphors and common themes. And that's something that I feel kind of dates back to my trying to survive going to public school and, and kind of juggle the, my history of homeschooling to the public school and these different realities and how they work and trying to find what, what the common themes are and, and what works better than other things. Um, so there, I could talk probably for a long time about that, but that's kind of the, the overview of what I have taken from my homeschooling few years that I had with my, with my mom at home and how it's related to my life. It's given me a way to see things and an appreciation for different life paths, I would say. Now, was there anything, did you, did you guys learn just like my, uh, mainly book stuff or did you guys ever do like gardening or anything like that? I know a lot of people are doing that oh, now in homeschooling. <laughs> yeah, I wish we did gardening. No, we didn't do gardening. Uh, yeah, it was, it was the basics of like reading and writing and math and, and a little bit of science and experiments and such. Uh, we did craft fairs. I remember my mom would always take us out to do crafts and making stuff with our hands. Uh, we did have a garden in the back. We had raspberry bushes and different vegetables and things that we played with, but I don't remember any sort of specific lessons as much as it was like go out and play and get your hands dirty and pick some fruit. And so we were, we were, even though we lived in the city, we still had that sort of uh, connection to the dirt. <laughs> um, so, and then when I was a bit older, I think this is still before I went to school, I was playing in the garden. This is a funny story, kind of separate from homeschooling, but in terms of gardening, it's related to your question. There was a stick for tomatoes to grow up. It was like a wooden stick. And I wanted to push it into the ground a bit further. And uh, I pushed it and it, the stick went into my hand and like down, I don't know how it got past my wrist. Like it got into my hand a good ways. And I was like, oh no, that's not right. And I pulled my hand out of the, pulled my hand back and the stick came with it. So the stick was coming out of my hand. And I was like, oh, this is really bad. <laughs> so I ran to my dad. I was like, dad, dad, dad. I was just showing him like this. And um, he sat me down on the edge of the, the van or the car, or whatever we had. And he, and he pulled the stick out. I remember just passing out and forgetting what happened. <laughs> But anyways, maybe that's why we didn't do gardening, uh, because uh, I injured myself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're really like today, you're very you, you post a lot about eating organically, taking care of yourself, uh, doing all those healthy things. Is that something growing up that you were as uh, that you guys were as conscious of growing up? Or is that something that changed through the years? So my mom was bless her she was doing all those sort of hippie things um even though she wasn't really a hippie but she was more of like a country girl in disguise because i never saw my mom as like that that kind of way but she had a lot of natural remedies and things that she would sort of gravitate to first before doing any sort of medication and stuff um my uncle my mom's brother big health guy big into uh health and wellness and fitness and such. So I'm guessing that that, that relationship and their connection uh, was also a part of that in my life being important. Um, I remember sitting at the table crying because I didn't want to eat my Brussels sprouts. <laughs> so my parents, my parents were, were very particular about us eating healthy uh, as best we could with uh, what we had at the time. Um, and then over the years, that conversation and that sort of practice has, has grown and I have sort of supported my parents as well got him a juicer and got him onto that kind of stuff as well. So it's been a, like health is a journey, right? So as a, at a young age, my, my parents were doing their best and continuing to grow to this day in that sort of path of tuning into your food, getting the best nutrients you can and becoming aware of the convenience in our lifestyle that actually has a lot of trade-offs and uh, problems when we eat those convenient foods or those packaged foods. So, uh, yeah. 
And I want to talk a little bit now for like when you were younger, um, go into like mental health a little bit. And I know that you've touched um, a little bit on um, not very much, but you have talked a little bit about on in your podcast and on Twitter, you had talked about like some darker times in your life when you had um, gone through some sexual abuse and then you had some anger issues. And I know that that took you mm. a while, as you said, to share and to also work through. But I want to know when you were younger and you didn't have the tools that you have today that have helped you, how did you cope with that? Like, was there different things that you did that helped you? I know you said your parents in your family was very in instrumental, but outside of that internally, how was that for you? So at the time, and this is what I've kind of found in life in general is when we don't have the tools, we gravitate towards the first thing that comes across our path, the easiest thing, the thing that's right there. And so for me, it was video games and angry music. That was a way for me to experience the emotions of pain and anger and frustration that I was going through and kind of have them have an outlet for them. And obviously those, those outlets aren't the healthiest and they don't actually help you move through the pain. Um, they are just um, mirrors, I guess you could say. You, you see somebody else experiencing that pain, whether it be an angry rap song or you know, music of some sort, and it's, you feel heard. And so that was kind of like a numbing sensation that I would be able to utilize to just keep my head above water. Um, then the first tool that actually started to help was when my mom suggested that I journal. And she said, I don't know what you're going through. I can tell that you're having a difficult time. I just want to recommend that you get a journal and just start writing out your thoughts, start writing out what you're feeling. And she said, you don't have to share it to anybody. You don't have to tell me about it. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, you don't have to show me or anything, but just get it out, put it on paper. And such a simple practice was actually the beginning of the healing because by expressing it from my heart onto paper, it wasn't spinning in my head anymore. And that's something I've learned later on in my life is that often if we don't write things down and get them out, we just sort of start to stew on them. Even unconsciously, it spins in our head and it pulls us down in the spiral. And so the journaling process is very simple, but that was what helped me is just get it out on paper and then I could see it. And then it wasn't spiraling in my head anymore. I could see, oh, those are my thoughts. I've already written that down. That's how I feel. So then it would allow me to move further to explore deeper what's after that, what's happening next. And this is a practice that I still use to this day. If I'm going through something challenging and I don't have the tools or I don't know what to do, I will allow myself to feel what I'm feeling and go through it. And I won't always journal. Most of the time I do, but sometimes it's just me consciously saying, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through and being patient with myself and allowing the next thing to unfold. What's beneath that? What's, the, what's behind that anger? What's behind that frustration? What's really going on here and being patient and curious with that process, even though it's super painful and uncomfortable. And then from that, I've always, yet to not have this happen, uh, been given a gift, been given a little insight, been given uh, an area for me to release or to surrender, to step up to, to have more courage in, to clean up my life in some way. Um, so that's all started from this, this process of journaling when I was younger. And that was the first tool that worked for me. But before I had any tools, it was the common things that I think a lot of people um, utilize. Video games, numbing. Is, video games is a way to numb out. You're distracting yourself. Uh, angry music as well. Uh, a way to channel that energy. Uh, I'm so grateful I didn't get into drugs or alcohol to do any of that stuff because uh, I know a lot of people do. Um, I used video games and and music as a way to numb myself because the emotions and the, the things I was feeling was so overwhelming. And like, like you mentioned, I, and I've mentioned before, I didn't have the tools. I didn't know what to do. So I gravitated towards those things that I first grabbed onto that were just in front of me. And, um, I'm glad it wasn't drugs or alcohol. I'm so grateful that that was not in my household, not in my friend circle, because if I did gravitate towards those things, it would have been a much more difficult journey for me, uh, to, to move through the challenges that I had. Now, the when you listen to like angry music and stuff, though, I know personally for myself, if I used to do stuff like that, it would make me more angry sometimes, though. Did you ever experience that listening to like doing video games? Because obviously, sometimes video games are violent. And sometimes like anger music, I don't know what your anger music was, but mine used to be like some headbanging stuff. And then I would 
you know, just kind of get aggressive with that. <laughs> Yeah, it would make me more angry, but it felt good because it was allowing that energy to kind of kind of move, right? As opposed to being stuck and suppressed. Anything that's suppressed in the body creates disease and, and dysfunction, right? So it was, it was um, yes, it didn't allow me to process the anger, but it allowed me to feel the anger fully. And so that's one step better than suppression, I believe. Um, if you suppress things, it makes you suppress emotions, you suppress things, it makes it worse because it stores it in the body. And then the body eventually says no, like Gabor Mate says in his book, when the body says no, is that the what you suppress in the body will eventually come out. And so angry music was a way for me to, yeah, to feel it. I mean, there's still songs. Uh, what's the song? It's, it's, um, I think it's Eminem, DMX. Uh, I don't know the title, but I know I what you're talking about. The song, but there's like, yeah, yeah. There's like this really angry song. And I remember, and I still, I heard it uh, maybe last year uh, for the first time in maybe over a decade or so. And it immediately, Lori brought me right back to that emotion. And I was like, oh, wow. I haven't felt this because it, it, you know, music smells, all those things can, can bring you right back to the moment when you first heard them. And that was uh, an emotion that I came back to. And I was like, wow, how far I've grown from that place of anger. Um, but yeah, that, that was one song I remember listening to. I remember very specific lyrics <laughs> that uh, I would just feel, I would listen to it over and over and over again because of the anger that I was feeling. And it just gave, it gave me a voice that I didn't have. Um, and it expressed it in a way that I was like, yeah, that's how I feel. And they're putting it into music. Um, there was no digestion. There was no processing. There was no healing from it. But at least they were expressing the emotion that I was feeling inside. So I felt heard in that way. And you had talked about, you know, feeling that feeling and how important that is. And I had recently, I was listening to um, a podcast, I think it was on Lewis House, and he had this woman who came on and talked about how a lot of people now, you know, they practice mindfulness and they'll do meditations and all, like all of the, the other practices, but they won't do that internal work. And essentially, if you're not going to do that internal work, no matter how much mindfulness you have and meditation you practice, you're going to continue in circular patterns. So how hard was it for you when you did start really doing the work that ultimately changed um, everything for you? How hard was it to embrace those really angry parts to since you had the tools now i think it's i think for everybody it's the hardest thing they've ever done because <laughs> in the context of their own life it will be the hardest thing you you do because it is the scariest area it is the most vulnerable it is the most un, unknown um i've i've tried not to compare myself to others because i feel like everyone's journey is sacred and so you know someone else who's gone through different things that i have you know I compared it, I might be like, oh, mine's not that bad. But for me, it's the hardest thing that I've done is, is face those internal demons and those fears and those insecurities, that, that pain. And, uh, but yet the simplest, not, not, not easy, but the simplest thing to do, uh, to just be honest with myself and to move into those things. And it's step by step, Lori. And I continue, I, I'm still doing it. I think that's the only, to me, that's like, you know, if you're, you're a basketball player, you go and you practice your, your free throws, you practice your layups, you practice your shots. I think being a human being is practicing your inner work. And, and the more you can face those areas of yourself that are difficult, that are challenging, the repercussions in your life just are magnificent, are glorious. And it's the, the ultimate feeling of freedom and bliss and enjoyment of your life because you're not living from a place of fear or of avoidance or of trying to control the outside world so that you don't have to think about the things you don't want to think about, or someone doesn't trigger you by saying a certain thing to you. I've, I've learned that the triggers and the things that upset me, it's, it's no one else's responsibility but mine to deal with. I'm not saying to tolerate abuse or somebody attacking you, but I'm saying is the things that irk me or frustrate me or make me scared or insecure. That's my work. That's my area to focus on. And I think, uh, Human beings on a whole, myself included, will always unconsciously, if we're not aware, gravitate towards the, the easy fix, the pill, the book, the, the course, the thing that will just do this thing, one thing, and you'll, you'll have it all figured out. We'll figure it out for you. You don't have to do this hard inner work. You won't have to face these demons or these insecurities. You won't have to do that really simple, but yet very challenging work of being honest with yourself and facing what you need to face. 
And so I think that is, uh, it's true in so many different areas of life. Fitness being another one. A lot of people, they want to look good, but they don't actually want to be athletic. So you, you look great. You got those big, for, for men, big muscles, but the actual application of physicality in the world, you know, it's not really the best. You don't have great cardio or, you know, you can't actually do these other things. I saw a great video on Instagram the other day. It was a rock climber who just looked like a regular guy. And he was lifting the same weights on this machine as these massive bodybuilders. And they were all going, this is crazy, man. Like you're, you know, a quarter the size of us, but you're lifting the same weight with no, you know, no strain. And so I think it's, it's, it's a part of our culture and our society where we strive to be seen and to be, get as much of the, the reward with the least amount of actual work <laughs> in the, in the, in the truest sense, the strongest foundation. So, um, it's difficult stuff, but it's the most rewarding, it's the most fulfilling, and it's the most sustainable area to start. So that's why I'm very passionate about it, because I know in my life it's been the most the most worthy effort to put in is to confront those areas of your life that are very deep, deep and challenging, because that will provide the most solid foundation for you to build the rest of your life upon, as opposed to trying to fake it or just trying to jump through all the mindset coaching and meditation stuff and say, I did it all. I should be fine. Uh, but it doesn't last and doesn't really produce a quality of life that is meaningful. And when, when you find yourself, like if, um, like you said, we all are going to constantly have work. We're never going to arrive is what Lynette says. And so on that, when you find yourself where you said like something triggered you or something that you thought that you worked through, when you experience that, that where it comes back around in that kind of circular pattern, how do you tackle that? Like, is it something as you've done so much work now that you can spot instantaneously? Do you have moments where you still have stuff that it takes a little bit for, for it to settle in for you to go, okay, this is something I need to work on? Yeah. I'm, <laughs> uh, last year around this exact time, I think it was last, yeah, it was last year. Uh, I had something come up for me that it would blew me out of the water. It was like a trigger. It was an event, a, a happening that I experienced that uh, made me feel like I'd made no progress at all. I was so upset and I was so triggered and emotional. I was like, what's going on? And um, I think that uh, you, you, you always, life will always give you the opportunity to demonstrate your growth. And it's not about like you learn the lesson, you'll never have to face that again. It's like, it's like you're surfing. I love the metaphor of a surfer on a wave. Like once you know how to surf, doesn't mean the wave isn't going to give you new twists and turns and challenge you to demonstrate your learning. It will always be doing that. So I see that as life is always giving us the opportunities to demonstrate our learning. And so sometimes it can be frustrating thinking I've learned this lesson so many times, but it's not about like, oh, I've learned this lesson so many times, so I shouldn't have to demonstrate it again. It's the, the framework that I do my best to remind myself of is, here's an opportunity for me to demonstrate again, the strength that I have and to refine it, to master it to an even deeper degree. And that is challenging in the moment, but rewarding in the long term. And so my, my practice when I'm faced with that, and it's frustrating because, you know, challenge happens again and something that I've been dealing with a lot. I, um, I give myself patience and compassion <laughs> and, uh, I, I acknowledge where I'm getting tense. So if I'm getting frustrated and tense because I don't want this to happen, I give myself the space to allow that to relax. Because once you're resisting in terms of what life is presenting you, it holds it in place. So the process of relaxing and allowing it to be will then give me the, the next step so I can move through it and learn from it as opposed to this shouldn't be happening. I've already learned this lesson. Get out of the way. I'm frustrated. I just want to be over here. <laughs> you know, like that, um, you know, when, yeah, th that's to me, that's how I see life is like, it's all the inner work and the fun. And then it's just like this fun sort of thing of like, Oh wow. And look at how it's coming out in the outside world. And the outside world is now reflecting back into my inner world, the areas of which I want to grow and need to bring some more love and attention to. Uh, this is all a beautiful dream. Uh, there's a, what's that thing, that saying of like, we are uh, souls having a human experience or something like that, spirits having a, a human experience. And so this, this human experience is this dream that we're all having. 
and it's this wonderful, fantastic experience and dream, but it all will fade away. And I believe that the soul, the essence of who we truly are, lives on. And so what did the soul come here to learn? What did it come to grow and, and to expand and to, to give and to contribute and to learn? That to me is the golden ticket. That to me is the most beautiful thing to focus on and then bring that learning, bring that insight into physical celebrations, manifestations, creations, movies, poetry, music, conversations, and, and let that be come through you. Um, that's how I see it. <laughs> That's actually a great lead way into a question that I wanted to ask you. Um, you had talked about one time, I think you were with Carrie and you said that you had done um, magic mushrooms and you went into the bathroom and you could see either the faces or the eyes of like previous embodiments. Do you remember this? Mm. You remember talking about this? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, do you ever have times where you can remember stuff that's not from your your embodiment now, like from those past lives? No, I don't. I don't. Um, the, the, yeah, the, the story about looking in the mirror, psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, it causes a lot of people to hallucinate. And um, I've only hallucinated a few times and that was one of them. And I saw through my right eye these different, it felt like faces where it looked, they were faces. And it felt like to me that these were previous lifetimes. And the insight that I got in that moment, whether it was real or just imagined, but what matters is the insight that I got was the idea of having possible lifetimes and journeys that we go through to learn things, to grow and to evolve. And here I am doing this one. Here is the character that I'm playing this time around. And how do I appreciate and acknowledge the challenges that he has, the growth that he has, the gifts that he has, uh, the areas in which he needs to love himself more, the areas in which he needs to let himself relax a bit more and surrender more. Uh, it, that to me was something I can't prove. Like I've said many times, my, my litmus test is, can I prove it? If I can't prove it or disprove it, does it benefit my life? And I can't prove or disprove that this is, I had previous lives. However, the idea of this does that improve my life? And for me, the way I looked at it was, yeah, it helps me appreciate this life and to make the most of it. And also to recognize that there is an ongoing growth process, that there is an ongoing journey of the soul of evolution. And I think that's beautiful. It, it helps enhance my life and feel more sacredness to it, more appreciation for it. And also to see other people as on this journey as well. Uh, so while I can't prove that we all leave, we live multiple lives, I've read a few books about it. And I think it's fascinating to me. It always comes down to how does it impact your life in this moment? Does it, does it detach you from reality? Does it make you sort of go, Oh, I have multiple lives. I don't have to do anything because I'll have another life to fix this, all, all this stuff. And then whatever, who cares? You know, like that's the impact here and now. And that's what I'm concerned with when, when it gets to spiritual ideas or, or pathways for people, I don't care what path you walk. If you believe in multiple lives or not, how does that impact your life? Does it improve the quality of your life? Does it give you a, an excuse to not do things? Or does it give you uh, a sense of superiority because you think you're better than everyone else because you follow this path and you think that you do these things so you must be you know, better? I always, I always try and, and take that litmus test and go, does this improve the quality of my life? And does this bring me closer to a sense of union and love and connection with others and contribution to the world? Or does it give me a sense of an ego boost, make me feel like I'm special and uh, I know something that other people don't know? <laughs> and I stay, I try my best to stay away from that stuff because I can't prove it. So it's just an ego, you know, thing that I'm getting caught in. So, uh, but yeah, no, no regular experiences of past lives. I do have moments of feeling like I've been here before, like deja vu, and it's like I'm on the right path. And I've had a number of those in the past week. And that's a cool feeling. Like, it's like, oh, I'm on the right path. This is a really cool feeling. It's almost like I've lived it before. So there you go. And um, I know that I asked you this question uh, when I saw you at one of your events, but I think it was a really great question to ask because I was curious. I know you had um, talked about how you had done ayahuasca before. And <clears throat> I asked you if 
do you think that someone who it doesn't want to go down that route could um, reach like levels of themselves that they that you had been able to discover doing that? And I know that you had told me yes. And I want to ask you to share that um, how you think that you can reach those levels. And I know you did share a, um, a three part series that I did listen to as well on uh, MDMA and psilocybin and all that. Um, yeah, so, uh, there's trade-offs with everything. And I think, uh, while ayahuasca, uh, with the, the active ingredient is dimethyltryptamine, DMT, uh, it's a, it's a brew, it's a, from the Amazon that you drink, um, and there's an MAO inhibitor in, that they combine in the drink. That's like these two plants in the Amazon rainforest. And when combined, they actually prevent your body from, getting rid of the excess dimethyltryptamine, which is, allows you this sort of boost of DMT, which your body produces naturally. It's not this sort of foreign chemical that's being put in there. It's actually a natural thing that your body produces, but just in very small amounts. And the com combination of these two plants uh, with the MAO inhibitor allows your body to experience a heightened level of dimethyltryptamine, which is normally only experienced, they believe, from my understanding, just before you die. So you have like this near sort of death experience or you were, you were experiencing a chemical sort of um, reaction in your body that is beyond what you would normally experience or similar to REM sleep. We get a lot of DMT in REM sleep as well, from what I've learned. I'm not a scientist, but this is some of the things I've read. Anyways, so this is the context of DMT and I've learned a lot from the two experiences that I had with it. I do believe that you can achieve or, or get to a place of understanding and, and appreciation for life without any psychedelic substances, uh, without doing crazy long breathwork sessions or fasting to, to uh, extraneous extents. I believe that each individual is going to be called to move deeper into their relationship with God and themselves in a way that works best for them. I think the problem today is that because these things have become more popularized, again, it's treated like a magic pill. And these guys are doing it, so I should do it. And they're not paying attention to their own intuition. They're not paying attention to their own bodies. And maybe they get involved in a a ceremony that's uh, not properly done or there's not a professional approach to it. Uh, there's a lot of dangers and there's a lot of risks associated with psychedelics that um, I personally believe people need to be very careful about. Uh, I, I know a couple people that have had bad experiences with psychedelics and they'll never touch them again. I see it like you're opening up the roof of your car and you're looking at the engine. And if you don't know what you're doing, you could switch some wires and unplug some things. And next time you start up the car, you could create a fire. You could create some problems. And so while they can be a very good tool, you, it's, they're, they're also very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And I have gotten similar insights and depth to my experience of being alive and my appreciation for my life from a silent meditation retreat, from a long walk in the woods, from just being sick and sitting in my bed and being silent and appreciating what it means to be alive. Um, I, I think it's important that people honor their own journey and that's why I always want to encourage people, whatever their spiritual path is or their background is to honor that and to explore it. And also if they feel called to try a meditation retreat or to do something a little different, that they trust themselves and trust that if they're being called to do this, to experiment with this or to explore this, that they do it at their own pace that they're continually tuning in and that they're honoring themselves in the process and they're not doing it to show off or they're not doing it to try and accomplish something so they can tell all their friends <laughs> that they did a silent meditation retreat or they did a ayahuasca ceremony and they travel around the world. It, 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 it's not about that. <laughs> um, it's work. I, 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 so I've said to people that, you know, ask me about ayahuasca. I said, it, it's not a party drug. It's not something you go and you do to like tell all your friends how amazing and all these cool things that you hallucinated. It, it's work and it's difficult. And it's also, you know, you need to be careful with what you're putting in your body. Um, there's side effects. You're with ayahuasca, you're puking and you're going to the bathroom and um, it's, it's heavy. Um, I probably won't ever do it again. Uh, I, to me at this point, I've seen a lot of experienced a lot of uh, that for in the context of my own life. And for me, what I feel called to more is the stillness and the silence. I feel that all the answers that anyone ever needs is always there for us. I don't believe the divine God, the universe, the way this works 
would restrict us to, and our growth to a specific drug. And then only once we do this drug can we learn this lesson. That makes no sense at all <laughs> in my world. <laughs> I believe that God and the divine and the way this whole thing works would be it always has the, the lesson, the blessing, the insight waiting for us if we are willing and prepared to accept and appreciate it. And for me, the best, the best gateway, the easiest gateway that's available to all of us is in the stillness and the silence in this present moment. And it's easier said than done sometimes, but I, that's how I think this all works. And I think that it's beautiful that it works that way. And it also comes with a feeling of, of course it works that way because I don't think God or the divine would ever uh, hold back in ways in which we are meant to be loved and, and shown the insights and given the, the next step. It would always be ready for us. We would just need to align ourselves with it. So when you, um, when you shared that documentary with me, the, um, uh, or the three part series, I listened to it and the doctor who had done the test said that, um, ultimately it's how people internalize those experiences. Are they going to internalize them and mm -hmm. go deep and take away, um, context to change their life or is it just like a fun experience or s some people had bad experiences so ultimately um whether you do that or you do like meditation and stuff like you were saying it's how you internalize and how you take that information and use it absolutely <laughs> yeah absolutely you can you can have the best healthiest meal prepared you can chew it but you don't swallow it and your body doesn't digest it. Who cares? Who cares? It was the healthiest thing ever. You made the best juices. You made the best meal. You chewed it, but then you didn't digest it. You threw it up and it doesn't get integrated into your body. So whatever, who cares? It's a waste. So I think that's what a lot of people do is they love taking photos of their food. You know, it's like, look at all these things that I'm doing, but it's like, have you integrated this? Have you actually digested it? That's, that's the hard part. That's not the sexy part. Right? So I think, <laughs> I think until human society gets to a tipping point of recognizing that difference, we'll be fascinated with the, the allure and the sexiness of, of the latest thing. You know, I, I believe it's coming. I think a lot of people, the conversation is shifting to that point now where people are recognizing who cares if you're not digesting it, who cares if it doesn't actually make an impact, who cares if it doesn't actually make a fundamental shift within you about how you see yourself and how you love yourself and how you live your life. Um, I think that's happening. I think people are recognizing the, the significance of that. And it's, uh, that's a good thing. I think that's a good, good step in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> and you're someone who does live very um, presently and you enjoy life. You know, we, where we don't have the perspective to see what the future holds. Um, I know there's that farming story where the guy says, maybe everything is maybe because he doesn't have that perspective for the future. And I love that. And I want to ask for you as someone who creates, um, how do you, how do you stay presently when things come up that don't work out for you um, without worrying too much of what the future outcome is going to be? Okay. So two points there. The, the, the story of the Chinese farmer being that uh, people anticipate or sort of project what the meaning of something being is. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry that your son got his leg broken by the horse that he was trying to tame. And in the farmers, Chinese farmer says, you know, maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe it's not. And then the army comes to conscript him and they, they reject the son because he's got a broken leg. And they say, oh, the neighbors all say to the Chinese farmer, oh, well, that's amazing that your son, you know, wasn't conscripted to the army, you know, he doesn't have to go and fight and die in these wars. And he says, maybe. So it's this idea that we don't know <laughs> the, the, the full scope of the God's plan of the divine plan of all of what this is meant to be. Um, so that is the perspective that I bring into to my life when I'm creating and when I'm trying to uh, shape my reality and, and celebrate life. If things don't work the way I'm think they're supposed to work or I want them to work, I step back into that relaxed state and remember God's plan <laughs> is always going to be so much better than what I could have imagined. That doesn't mean that I don't have to have goals and have discipline and move forward and progress, challenge myself and get out there 
and be active and learn and grow and put myself in uncomfortable positions, it means that at the same time I'm doing that, I'm also in complete surrender to something far beyond what I could have imagined coming into my life. And that is difficult because you're engaging both at the same time. You're actively participating in life. You have goals and things you're moving towards. You have desires that you're creating. But at the same time, you are constantly tuning in and feeling to what I call God's plan or the divine plan in this moment. Ah, am I being directed this way? Is this actually not the path that I'm supposed to take, but I needed to get to this point to learn X, Y, Z lessons or to meet these people. And now I'm meant to go this way. Um, it's a constant for me opportunity to pray, to listen and to feel God's plan one step at a time. And that is easier said than done. <laughs> but, uh, that is the, what I have found in my own life. And I'm still practicing that and working that as best I can has been the most beneficial and productive and also sustainable uh, way to live my life. And it's also the most adventurous. I'm, I'm sure that there are many people out there and uh, I get trapped in this sometimes where I have goals and aspirations and I achieve them and I'm like, oh, well, that's it. Like I thought I, I, thought I would feel better about that. Like kinda, it's almost like I kind of get bored. Like I'm like, well, I did that. Now what? And so on the flip side of that, when I'm in tune and listening to in this moment, what I'm feeling called to do or to not do, God's plan, as I call it, or the divine plan, it's always beyond what my mind could have come up with. And it's always exciting and it's always adventurous and it's always challenging. And that to me is a much more juicy way to live. It's, it's, it's very challenging, <laughs> but I prefer it to, to trying to grip the steering wheel on my own and just force everything the way I want it to be. Um, you have that option. You can do that. Uh, I just, I, I like this, the, the surprises that God brings me as opposed to, you know, forcing myself <laughs> into this world. And, and, and I, I've always said this is that way, forcing my way through life, I'll do 10 times the effort and get half of what I thought I was going to get. Whereas God's plan, I do half the effort that I thought I had to do and 10 times the reward. Um, the real effort when it comes to following God's plan is the courage and the faith and the setting aside of the ego and of the facing of the demons and the insecurities and the fears and the doubts, which, you know, you do that and it's, it really is half the amount of work, the grunt work, the mental stuff, the, it, it's actually like far less, but the real work that you have to do is that internal stuff. And then all the other things, they just happen to work themselves out and you go, whew, it's kind of amazing. Like, it feels like I can dodge bullets. It feels like I can sort of like, you know, in the matrix when he like jumps across the buildings and he does all this sort of supernatural stuff to me that I, I see that as being aligned with God, the divine and God's plan. It's just like, you feel you have wings. You feel like you can overcome things that otherwise you couldn't. And you couldn't because you're, you're aligned. And that's where I feel it's a very exciting place to live in service to, and constantly exploring, you know, what God is, is presenting you with. And so if you get like stuck in your head, um, is that when it gets like, when you're like, okay, I have a couple paths I can take, but I am kind of stuck or I don't know what, I don't know what action to take. Is that because you're more stuck in your headspace versus from a heart space? Because what I kind of grasp is that when you're in that heart space, you're constantly going to know the way to go. Am I correct with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the head, the head, when you're stuck in the head, your head will be thinking, well, if I do this and how is it going to work out here? And how's it? You're, so you're 10 steps ahead of like, I don't know if I go down this path and 10 steps ahead. And if I go down this path and 10 steps ahead, it's not going to work. And you're kind of stuck in this sort of like choosing between two paths and neither of them making sense. And uh, I've always said this and I've, it's, I mean, it's, this is what I've learned in my life is that you're not meant to think 10 steps down the road like that. You can, and for certain planning projects and stuff, it's helpful to kind of do that thought experiment. But the actual decision of which path, in my personal experience has been, in the heart, in this moment, the step right here. And that sometimes is very hard for the ego and the mind of like, yeah, but if I take this step, how is that going to work out here? <laughs> and that's the, that's the courage and the faith part. Because the mind wants to go, well, if I take this step, how is this going to work? And I don't know how that's going to work. So it can't be that way. If I take this step, it's not going to work like this. 
So that's where the mind sort of like hijacks the process. And this is where, again, I said the real work is in the faith and the courage in the internal world. And you, I yet to have an experience or talk to someone where this hasn't been true, but you will always be given exactly what you need to make this step in this moment in the direction that your heart is calling you to, to, to take. And from that place, you will have a new vantage point. You will have a new discovery. And you go, ah, just like the Indiana Jones movie where he takes that leap of faith and he steps off the cliff and the bridge, the walkway appears for him. He couldn't see it before. His mind was going, how do I get to there? It's so far away. It's not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Well, he had just to take the one step, the one step that was right in front of him. And then the whole walkway was presented, right? Now, that is that is the metaphor. It's always the one step. It's always the one place uh, uh, that is right in front of you. Because again, this is what I'm saying is God, the divine will always give you exactly what you need to take the next step. Why, why would, why would God torture you? <laughs> we torture ourselves. We are the ones that prevent ourselves from doing this, getting stuck in our head and, you know, trying to have this all, our minds are wonderful tools and they can plan and create and envision things. They're fantastic, but they're, we also, there's a trade-off to that. And if they run the show, they can get us tripped up and we can get trapped in this thought spiral of what ifs uh, and all the things that could go wrong. And it doesn't make sense. And, all, and there's this beautiful magic and synchronicity of a divine sort of orchestration of our lives that we can't fathom with our minds. We can't, we can't wrap our heads around. And only when we live our lives from that heart centered place in, you know, from here and take that next step, and then looking back, we can go, oh, wow, that was beyond what I could have imagined. I didn't know that I was meant to be here to talk to this person, to learn from them or for them to learn from me, to, to have a conversation with them or just to listen to them. And I was in that flow, in that right place at the right time. And now look at the ripple effects. And it's far greater than my mind could have conceived. And so time for my little ego to kind of take its back seat be a great servant, be a great, you know, cruncher of numbers and planner, all fantastic. But my relationship to God through my heart is what runs the show, is what dictates my decisions. And I'm going to use my mind and, and, and train my mind as best I can to have uh, a focus and goals and desires and ways in which I can discipline myself and improve. However, the, the place in which I live my life and make decisions from is that this harmony and synchronicity between the two, but it comes from my heart. It's informed by my mind, but it comes from my heart. And I'm not saying an emotional heart. I'm not saying like, you know, I'm, I'm feeling this wave of emotion. So I go down this path. It's a stillness from my heart. It's a silence and it's a stillness that comes from a grounded place in my heart. Uh, as opposed to what some people, when they, when they talk about the heart, they say is all emotional. And no, no, I'm not talking about running with your emotions and just going, well, I felt excited. So I went down this path. No, no, I'm talking about being still and silent and present and listening. And from that place, there is the mind quiets and what comes forth is the truth. What comes forth is this, this is the next step. And that sometimes can be very scary and very angering. And sometimes it can be very inspiring and relieving, but you will know with your entire being that this is the truth. And that's the way I like to live my life. <laughs> and sometimes though, um, I know this because I had a conversation with you about um, how I was feeling when something wasn't working out for me. And I remember you asked me a question about it. And I was like, I don't know. And I knew, but I didn't want to admit it out loud. I don't think I don't think I was ready for that moment to to be like, okay, this is why this isn't working. Um, or you know, I didn't want to believe that it took me a couple days <laughs> to acknowledge that when that happens for you, because I think all of us get in those moments where we're like, okay, yep. this, I don't want to, I don't want to acknowledge this. I don't want, I want to pretend that it's not that way. How do you, how do you maneuver that? Like, is it a, a quicker process for you or do you still have times where you get stuck? <laughs> oh yeah, of course I do. <laughs> uh, the times when we don't want to acknowledge it is because this is what I've learned is because we're receiving something underneath the table. We're receiving something from holding on to this false belief or this, you know, insecurity or, or whatever that we don't want to acknowledge. So we resist letting it go because we don't want to let go of what we're actually benefiting from by holding on to it. And so I experienced that in my life many times. And so my, pro my process, when I'm faced with something that I don't want to acknowledge, I go, what am I receiving? What am I actually getting, you know, under the table that I'm not acknowledging? Uh, 
that is preventing me or, or, or making it more difficult for me to acknowledge and appreciate what I'm being shown in this moment. And so that's, that to me has been a, a great place to start when you're having difficulty accepting something that's being presented to you or shown to you and you're tuning into and you're like, Oh, wow. And I don't want to accept that though. It's like, okay, so what am I getting by not accepting that? What is the benefits or the, the, it's, um, I learned this from a course called landmark and it's like, what are you getting under the table? You're, you're pretending you're not getting it, but you're getting something underneath the table. And it's that thing that you have to go, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to release this. I'm not going to accept this anymore. And what then happens, I have found, is that you go, oh, but I want this. But this makes me feel significant. This makes me feel whole. This makes me feel um, whatever. And so then it goes, oh, these are the ways I need to love myself. I need to appreciate myself. I need to let go of this, you know, fear or insecurity and step into it with courage. And then I won't feel this urge to accept these things underneath the table and pretend that I'm not getting them and engage in this falsehood on the surface. So it's a, <laughs> again, you don't have to remember any of this. All I'm, my whole thing is just be curious and playful and breathe through this process. Oh, I don't want to accept this. Be curious, be playful and breathe. Oh, why don't I want to accept this? What's happening? What's happening? Well, cause I want to keep doing this or cause I really like this thing. Why do I really like that? Well, I really like that because when I was younger, I never got that and I never felt loved or I never felt appreciated. I never felt seen. And this is when one way that I'm finally feeling loved and appreciated and seen. And I, I, I deserve that. And I want that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Here are the, here are the trade-offs. You're going to live your life in this spiral. You're going to live your life unconsciously needing this, unconsciously taking this and trapping yourself in a scenario, in a job, in a relationship that is preventing you from growing is, is not actually fulfilling. So you have that choice. You always have that choice. And once you bring enough awareness, like I said, the curiosity and playfulness will help sort of de uh, energize the situation, kind of allow you to see it for what it is. That's the approach I take. And then you have a choice to make. And in that choice, you can shift and you can release yourself from that unconscious pattern that receiving underneath the table and, uh, and love yourself, appreciate yourself in the ways that you haven't been. You can believe in yourself in the ways you haven't been or you've been looking for somebody else to. And that is simple but not easy. And that is how you free yourself from these, these traps. Uh, because that's all it is. This is a coping mechanism that we learned unconsciously. We, we gravitated towards and we held on to. And that was what helped us get through. And then it created a behavior and a lifestyle and a pattern, a way of living our lives that is reaching its end. And now we're going like, but, but this is the way it's always been. And I don't know what else to do. This is who I am. And, and then by allowing yourself to explore it playfully and cur curiously, you can then look at what you're holding on to and you can go, okay, this is maybe really difficult to accept, but this is why I'm holding on to it. And I can release this and I could let this go and I can move a different direction now and I can take care of myself in the way I haven't been taking care of myself or, come to terms with the things that I haven't come to terms with. That's my process. Hopefully that made sense to you. It did. It did. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, creatively, what has had the most significant impact on your life and why for you? What thing have you made, created, done that? Oh, oh, uh, yeah. I would just say, um, uh, I'd probably say my, my, my podcast. Um, and because for me at this point in my life, um, growing up doing acting since I was six years old, uh, going through some sexual abuse, which really, uh, challenged me in so many different ways. I then used acting as a way to validate myself and give myself a sense of significance, uh, that I was desperately, uh, craving because of the false beliefs that I associated with the sexual abuse and my self-worth. And then going from that acting, sort of chasing this idea of being famous and being significant in the eyes of the world, uh, then to be realizing that this is not going to bring me fulfillment or any sense of uh, real love for myself and heal any of these parts of me that need that love. Uh, realizing that I needed to step into myself, step into my life, appreciate it and have that sacredness with it. The podcast was a step into believing in myself and to saying, this is who I am. And while I had done that in sort of very, very small ways, 
the character that I played on Heartland was known, loved by people, quote unquote, loved uh, a fictitious character that they thought and they associated with me. So that was sort of fulfilling a superficial surface level, um, what I thought would bring me ha- health and happiness and love and all the different things that somebody would want in their life. I thought it would bring me to bring it to me and it didn't. And so the podcast was my rewriting my internal story and saying, I'm going to take a chance on being loved or hated for who I truly am, as opposed to falling into my grave, grasping onto a character that I never was. And that's a quote from, from Jim Carrey, one of his interviews. And I, that took that to heart. And so the, the act of creating a podcast, uh, was very difficult for me because I had a psychological attachment to being a character on a TV show that so many people knew and wanted me to continue playing. But yet Graham was dying. Graham was shriveling up and, and, and gasping for air. And so to create a podcast and a, and a journey and share that journey with other people from my heart of what I felt passionate about, what I felt connected to, uh, and explore that with people, uh, that is something that is, is tremendously meaningful to me. And I'm very grateful that I took a chance on being loved or hated for who I really am. And all the comments and things about, you know, like every once in a while I get comments from people, what are you, you screwed up and you should do this and you should do that. And you should have done this. And, and it's, <laughs> it's interesting because the quality of people that are saying that to me, my suspicion is my senses is, is that in, in a subtle way, I am revealing to them, I'm triggering them in their life in a way that they never took a chance on themselves. They fulfilled the roles that they felt they should have fulfilled because they were told to fulfill them and they were doing what they were told was best. And so my behavior is triggering to them because they feel that they sh- I should have done what they did. And that's not everyone, that's very few people, but I did, I did receive some of those comments and that was something that I took, I kind of took a step back and I go, this isn't personal because I don't know these people, but what's actually going on here? And I thought, well, you know, in my life, when something happens and it triggers me, it's normally because it's an area of my life that I didn't want to acknowledge or there's a, a, some growth there. And so I'm attacking somebody else, but really what's going on is I'm scared and I'm feeling insecure inside. And uh, I'm attacking that person because they made me feel that and I disagree with them. So I'm going to try and get them back in line because I don't like feeling <laughs> what I'm feeling. So I don't know if that's what's going on with them, but that's my suspicion. For, for a couple of those people that have reached out to me in that way. And that's okay, because honestly, uh, that's why this creation is the most meaningful to me, is that I feel at home and I feel at peace within myself. And from someone who has gone through some trauma in the past with sexual abuse and feeling very disoriented and very discombobulated and uncentered and ungrounded uh, with the false beliefs that comes with, with uh, sexual abuse, the feeling of sacredness and peace and love for my life now i no one can take that away from me and i don't care (laughs) if nobody listens to my podcast or if nobody likes my decisions i have found an appreciation and a love for my life that i didn't have before um and that that is truly meaningful to me and i and i want to share that with other others so i hope in some way that i can inspire them to make a similar investment in their own sacredness of their own life and step and break free from and step away from the chains of you should do this and everybody is doing this. So you should too. And everybody has their own path to take and their own time when they break free. And I left mine to, (laughs) it was really, really long and it was almost to the last second. It was very difficult, but I turned it around and I'm grateful I did. Um, I made a promise to myself in the mirror and I said, I'm not going to let you let you die. I'm going to be here for you, buddy. So um, that was the journey that I took. And I'm very grateful for the support from others and from good, true friends that supported me on that journey of creating a new path for myself. And, uh, and that's, to me, the beauty and, and wonder of life is that there's always a new day. There's always a new opportunity. As long as we've got air in our lungs, we can focus our mind with our attention we have the the power to shift our lives if we're willing and being courageous enough to face the things that we've been avoiding. So my podcast would be then my answer to that question. Uh, what is your, what's the most for you? Is there a moment from your podcast that's most meaningful to you? 
I've had lots of moments. Um, I wouldn't say there's one that's the most meaningful. I would say uh, different people that have written to me that have shared their feedback or their experience of the podcast. Um, I'm, I'm getting for the first time, some people that didn't know me from the Heartland show and they've just heard my podcast and they didn't know I was an actor on, on Heartland. And so that's cool too, because there was a part in my life where I thought I'll always be that guy. And for a lot of people I will be, and that's fine, (laughs) but it's cool to, to, for other people to recognize me or to, to appreciate me and have, uh, and value the work that I'm doing completely separate from, from being an actor and, and playing a character on a, on a TV show. So, um, that's cool. Uh, I think the most meaningful conversations or, or interactions I've had from the podcast are people that have just shared their appreciation with me about the journey and their, their own inspiration to step out of their comfort zone and ask themselves that question. What does the time come for? And just get really real and present. Because effectively, the question is, just get present with yourself. What does the time come for in your life? Because it kind of brings you into this present moment of like, okay, it assumes that there's, the time has come for something. So what has the time come for? So it's, it's this way of a, bringing all your attention into this moment, acknowledging where you're at, and facing the reality and going, okay, I feel the time has come for me to be more honest with myself, to be more loving, to love my partner more, to appreciate the blessings that I have that I've been overlooking or spend more time with my kids. Or it's just this way of tuning in and listening and being like, what does the time come for? How can I step into this moment more fully? So hearing people's reactions to that and their own journeys has been awesome. Now, I know you have your platform built out as well from your with your time has come as well. And I know that you in, really enjoy helping other people on their journey. So I was wondering, have you ever considered doing like a biography or a self-help book since you had so many of your own that helped you on your journey that you read? Have you ever thought about exploring that avenue of doing that book option to um, be able to reach even more people? Because you are, so you have a lot of wisdom and knowledge. So there's a lot to learn from you. Well, thank you, Lori. Um, I think if the time comes and I feel inspired to write a book like that, sure. Um, the way I, I the way I, the way I'm living right now is uh, doing my best to share what I have learned and what works for me, and do my best to learn from others as well. Uh, if it gets to a point where I feel that the time has come for a book, (laughs) then I'll write a book. Um, personally, I, you know, my, my latest book, uh, time has come poetry and reflections. Uh, I, I kind of structured it in, in, in a sort of self-helpy way where I would have reflections for people just to kind of ask themselves these kind of questions. Maybe in the future, it would be an expansion of that, uh, I don't know. We'll see when I, I, I'll let you know when the time comes, uh, I'll let you know if that's, if that's on the horizon. <laughs> okay. Judgments. Okay. So I have struggled a little bit with judgments and discernment because there are some times where I feel like, and I'll use, um, I'll use politics as an example. So with politics, like you can discern what's going on. I totally get that. But then there's times where you'll see where people will make comments that actually attack a person personally, but it, or their family. And to me, even though they're in, they're a public figure, to me, that's still a judgment. So what the question is, is when you are looking at things going on in the world, how do you look at it from a perspective of discernment versus um, judgment? Okay. Judgment and discernment in politics. I believe that judgment is a condemnation or a sort of you're good, you're bad, you're right, you're wrong. Discernment is a looking at the facts. I also believe that there are truths, protecting of innocence, Uh, respecting people's privacy, allowing the growth of the individual to explore and experience themselves, that is something that should be defended. Um, So for me, that would be a discernment of like, yes, these are values that I want to uphold. 
Um, so getting stuck, you were asking me about getting stuck in judgment and discernment when it comes to po political stuff that gets very charged. Um, I see this as a grand play, grand cosmic play that's necessary for the evolution of consciousness. And so there are people that play the bad guy. There are people that operate at a lower vibration. There are people that do horrible things. And it's very hard to understand when you're in the thick of it, why this is happening and, and hard not to judge them. And it doesn't mean that if you're not judging them, that you're condoning them. And I think a lot of people get those two things confused. If there's a behavior that needs to be stopped, they go, well, I need to judge them. Otherwise it's going to continue. And they think by judging them or hating them or pushing and fighting them, that that is going to stop the behavior, but it doesn't. Now, the next step is, well, if I don't judge them, then how are they going to know? How are they going to know that they shouldn't be doing this? I need to sort of exert my anger and my judgment over them to make this stop. Well, you can actually, so if, if there's a two-year-old that's hitting somebody else, you can step in and say, no, we're not going to do that. You're not going to go, you, and call them all these names and judge them and you just tell them how such a horrible person they are. They're a two-year-old, <laughs> right? So it is possible to have discernment, to step in and, and correct behavior or to prevent behavior or to say, I don't stand for this without judging that person. I think judgments are used as like a weapon. Um, but like I've said in one of my poems there, that the weapons that you use are actually just pointing the three fingers back at you. You're actually revealing the ways in which you are insecure or you are weak. So when you're running around judging other people, it's because you have this fear of being judged yourself and you don't want other people to judge you. And so you're, you're, uh, labeling everybody else and trying to position yourself above other people. So I believe that there is a way to navigate life, to use discernment, whether it be in politics or real life, where you can say, I don't stand for this, or I don't agree with this, and I, I want to move down this path, and I want to stand for this. I want to speak out against the vaccine. I want to speak uh, against this political party, or I want to say that this is the path we should go down without coming from a place of anger and hate and judgment and all these different things. And just say, I don't accept this behavior, or I don't think this is uh, the best way we should, we should live our lives. And that requires some inner work. So when, when I get charged, <laughs> uh, aggravated um, by politicians or politics, I uh, do my inner work first. And I recognize that this is a process of evolution, a growth. And even though that can be dangerous and people can actually lose their lives or be permanently injured or damaged from what is going on in the world. This is difficult to say, but it is necessary for the growth of, I believe, consciousness as a whole. Now, that is only necessary because the awareness isn't there. Once enough awareness comes into the picture, we don't need to do these types of things. We don't need to kill each other. We don't need to do these horrible crimes to each other. We can have the awareness to go, this is not necessary. However, in the process of discovering and remembering the beauty and wonder and sacredness of life and in, in, in the individual lives that we're all living, we make mistakes. And some of those are grave mistakes and we pay for those. There's no getting out of them. There's no like, you'll never have to pay the price for that. We may not see it, but I believe on a soul level, all the things that we've fallen out of alignment with, whether it be a, a dramatic thing or a very you know harsh thing like a murder or doing something horrible to somebody else, or just so very simple as telling a lie or, or being dishonest. All of those things need to be atoned for. They need to be uh, recentered and and done. Do the inner work for. And so, uh, it, this might not be digestible for everybody because it's really hard sometimes to grab, put your head around this. But uh, this is a process of growth. Just like when you go to the gym, you you literally tear the muscles to grow them back and build them back stronger. If you tear them too much, yeah, it's going to be, you're going to be out of the gym for a while. <laughs> so there is this healthy thing and it's about bringing the awareness to the process of growth that we can avoid maybe some of the more unnecessary pain and suffering that's going on in the world through our awareness and our appreciation and our stepping into the sacredness of life. But it's, it's a part of this reality is going through very difficult times. And I believe the best way to navigate that is without judgment, like you said, lean into discernment while still taking a stand and still going about what you feel called to do to stand up and voice your opinion and also to listen to other people that you don't agree with. You know, this is not just like, oh, I voice my opinion. I don't care what anybody else has to say. I'm following what I feel called to do. 
and then step into the uncomfortable feeling of, and what if I have to listen to someone I don't agree with? And what if I have to change my beliefs on somebody that I, I disagree with my entire life? And now actually I kind of agree with them. Okay. That's uncomfortable for me. I've told everybody that I don't like this person. And now, now I actually kind of agree with them. Oh, what's going on there? So I have to release some judgments and I have to kind of say, I'm sorry, because I judged this person and I really called them out or I really bad mouth them. Um, that, that, that to me is the evolution of consciousness. That's the, that's part of what we're doing here as human beings is growing and learning, making mistakes. Um, there's a great book, many lives, many masters by Brian Weiss. And like we talked about earlier, this idea of having multiple lives, I can't prove it, but some of the lessons that he talks about these people that go into, uh, they kind of go to that, uh, hypnosis and they sort of recall these past lives that and details that they know where they could have known these types of things. They're not historians and, but yet they're recalling all these very intricate details of previous past lives and the, and the experiences they've gone through. What I found fascinating about that book was some of the stories of people that, you know, whether it be they murdered this person or they come back as their daughter or their son. And there's this, there's this relationship of learning and these people that have these um, entwined growth paths that they're learning from each other. And from our limited perspective, sometimes it can feel very disorienting and just horrible and wrong. And those behaviors are, however, taking a step back, it's like, oh man, like there was a process of learning through this. And I know for some people this is, because I know for me, it was very hard to wrap my head around this. Like, how can you acknowledge this as being okay? I'm not. What I'm saying is there's a duality here. There is a, an active in the moment, acknowledging this is behavior is not okay and I'm going to stand against it or I'm going to stand up for innocence or I'm going to stand for truth. I'm going to stand for peace. And at the same time, recognizing that there is a journey and there's a bigger picture going on and there is an evolution happening that just like a cell in the muscle might be upset that it's getting ripped apart. How could this happen? I'm, I'm losing everything. <laughs> it can't see the bigger picture that the muscle is actually growing stronger. I think COVID uh, as a prime example of it ripped a lot of people and families and friendships and relationships apart. It destroyed so many people's businesses. And yet now people are recognizing true value in community, true value in friendships, true value in how do they structure their businesses and things. So I'm not saying we, we should be like, yay, COVID happened. Everything blew up and you know people lost their lives. I'm saying sometimes these things are necessary for the growth of us as a whole even if it's hard to see sometimes and i myself have had a hard time seeing that sometimes when i'm in the thick of it uh so that's a very big answer to a question about judgment and discernment but that's the way i look at it i love what you said when you were talking about like um people that you disagreed with now you agree with and i know that was a big part of my own journey and one of the things that i've learned a lot about is that from from my for my own self is that for a long time I just wanted to associate with people who essentially I wanted to be in an echo chamber only people who agreed with me only people who had the same thoughts as me and I really learned um that it's really important to have conversations respectful conversations with people to get different perspectives and understand because when you take that time and if you do that research you might change your mind on things and that was something and even doing like my podcast, like creatively, this has been the best thing for me because it it forces me to try and learn more, try and like, I'm going to use the word, it's not the correct one, but like level up. Like I, even the people that I want to follow on social media or, you know, all those different things to learn from, I look at people who are farther ahead in the journey than I am, because I think that there's a lot to learn and grow from when you look at people from different backgrounds and different perspectives. Amen. And it's not easy, as I'm sure you know, because you have to question those preconceived notions that you had about life. And, um, and also maybe it's at some point also believe in yourself in the ways you haven't believed in yourself and your perspectives. And, you know, there's a bunch of other people that are saying, you know, oh, this is the way to go. And you're like, ah, man, that doesn't feel like right to me. Like, it's weird. I want to because everybody else feels that way, but that doesn't feel right for me. And so in some ways, it's the opposite where it kind of it asks you to have a better 
a stronger faith and, and belief in your own intuition, your own sense of self. Um, so I think it happens. There's both sides of the coin. The stepping outside of your comfort zone and maybe looking at things or people or perspectives in a new way that maybe you're a little, make you a little uncomfortable, but also maybe double down and, and believe in yourself in the ways you haven't believed in yourself. And everybody else is kind of saying this, but he's like, actually, yeah, that doesn't feel right for me. Um, so I think both, both things happen in that process. And I, I'm always about growth. So if it's, if it's leading you to a deeper level of understanding and appreciation and growth so that you can contribute in life, seems to me like you're probably on the right track. Now, I want to talk to you about uh, kind of a hot button topic, um, because a lot of stuff has gone on the past couple of years. And one of the, the things that I noticed a lot, especially with social media and the news and everything being so prevalent, is the toxic masculinity and the feminist movements that have come out. And I want to get your perspective on those, because um, I, from what I've gathered like a lot of for men the the things that people were labeling as toxic masculinity were you know exercising taking care of yourself standing up protesting doing those type of things those were considered toxic so i want to know at, from a male perspective how how have you viewed that in the world we see this as again kind of getting back to this idea of the expansion of consciousness so i think where there is an a level of unconsciousness, just like in your home, if there's an area of your house that you don't clean, what happens? You get mold, you get little mice that come in, you get problems that arise because the light of awareness is not there. So we bring awareness there. Now, what happens, what I have found is that if there is a segment of society, if there is a political party or, or perspective that is shunned or pushed down, um, eventually they, it gains this momentum and, and rightly so, they speak up and they voice their concerns and they, they organize, whether it be um, women or a certain minority or a certain group of people that have been discriminated upon, against, I should say. Um, and there is an organic sort of like, this isn't right. Like, we should be treated uh, fairly. We should be treated with love and respect and seen as human beings and not as less than. And what I have found is that uh, there is a manipulation game of power. And so there is, there is a way to, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's a way to manipulate people where you take something, a natural or organic expression, and you twist it. Um, similar to when you're driving, you sit on your wallet, you don't really notice it, but over time your spine gets a cut. And it's cracked. It's out of, out of alignment. So you take something natural and just put a little wedge underneath it and you can distort it and you can fragment it and then you can twist it, manipulate it and control it. And I think a lot of these movements uh, have been distorted and used to control people because that is what unconsciousness does. It will find the areas in which needs to be, there needs to be growth and better balance. It will exploit those things. And then we bring awareness and love uh, and discernment to those areas and we neutralize we clean the house so to speak so toxic masculinity all that to be said toxic masculinity i believe it started in this awareness this idea that hey um there is an extreme that any person whether they be female or male can come about using the masculine energy to be uh, overly aggressive to be uh unconcerned with the well-being of others uh which to me is an immature masculine so to me, toxic masculinity is just an immature masculine. However, that has been distorted and used to now control men and used to shame them and uh, not appreciate uh, the true blessing of a healthy, mature, masculine man. So that's how society is now twisting that and manipulating that uh, because there is any, any time you can control a group of people, you can get power from that. And I think there will always be a level of unconsciousness that is seeking, whether it be a psychopath in power or, you know, your next door neighbor that is seeking to control others to gain power from because they haven't recognized the power within themselves and they're not surrendered to a higher power to work through them. So they seek to feed off other people. And if they got a lot of money and power, they seek to do that off groups of people. And so I think that's what's happening with um, the idea of toxic masculinity, starting in a concept of awareness of, hey, we need to, as men, mature and bring a healthy masculine into this world that uh, is balanced and that is in tune with 
uh, um, themselves. And then that has been taken to the extreme to exploit uh, and to take advantage of people. Um, and then also for people that have been wounded by men or the masculine to then get their revenge. And so I think that's what a lot of uh, the polarization has happened now is that there is a revenge or a, uh, an unconscious wounding that is being played out through, I want men to suffer because I suffered, or I want women to suffer because I suffered, or I don't like the chaos that they've caused in my life or the pain or the things that they've done to me. So I'm going to shame all women for the things that they've done. So there's this sort of like polarization and attacking of each other because of the unconscious wounds that they have. Um, I think a lot of these movements uh, started in a place of a genuine inspiration for love and respect. And then that got uh, uh, captured by or manipulated to drive and control that movement to, to con control people's behavior. So it always boils back to your relationship to yourself and recognizing if you're, you're, your own level of manipulation from the outside world, because that is what I feel we're being presented with as a collective, this lesson of my own wounds and challenges that I've had are being commercialized or, or packaged in such a way to get me to think a certain way, to vote a certain way, to buy a certain thing, to hate these people, to love these people. And it, it, we, we'll, we'll know we're being manipulated by these ideas of toxic masculinity or femininity or political perspectives if we don't get any resolve, we don't find peace in the pursuit of these activities or these belief systems or this action, where we just feel continually drained and enraged, that is a telltale sign you are being manipulated by a, an operating system, something designed to control you and take advantage of an unconscious wound that you have to steer you in the way that they want to steer you. Um, so I hope that'll make sense, but effectively that's the way I look at these movements. Uh, I look at, um, this is a healing process. And in that process, there are organisms, there are people, there are things that will take advantage of the spots that you haven't cleaned in your house because there's available energy there. There's food to be eaten there. And, um, and our job is to bring light and awareness to it and clean those areas and recognize the wounds that we have that are being, we're being, are being used against us to manipulate us to hate these people, to love these people. And uh, once we do that healing, once we do that inner work, then these exterior things, it's very, very black and white to see. You could, oh, they're just manipulating these people because these people hate men or these people have been wounded by men or these people don't like these things. And they're being constantly poked and prodded to say, you know, these people are going to attack you. These people hate you. They want to erase you and they want to do all these things and you should hate them back and vote this way and buy this thing and hate this person. <laughs> and once you do your inner work, you, they can't poke you anymore. They can't stimulate you like that. And you don't become unconscious and just kind of become this robot. And uh, we, I'm, I still fall victim to that sometimes too. And then I recognize, oh, well, look at that. That's a wound from the past. And I'm, I'm projecting that into this. And I want this person to suffer. I want this person to be proven wrong because then that will give me this sense of satisfaction because back in the day, I wanted this person to be proven wrong. And I've, exter I've, I've sort of projected that into this scenario so that I can get this feeling of satisfaction because what really I actually want is to love myself and to allow the pain that I felt to move through me and to release that person, that event, and this situation I'm feeling, it has nothing to do with this politics. It has nothing to do with this toxic masculinity or, or whatever the, the thing of the day is. Um, it's just me projecting my wound onto this, trying to solve it through this other thing that I'll never solve it through. But yet I, I'm being entrapped in it because I'm unconscious to it. And therefore I'm being used by it. Um, so I think the, the, the mature feminine, the mature masculine... Uh, is a beautiful thing that when working together is the most fantastic uh, marriage of energies that creates new life and that uh, is the sacred balance of these energies, whether it be, we both have masculine and feminine energies in, in male and female, by the way. And so the, the combination of these two is the most beautiful thing. And so like anything that's seeking to extort and extract value from something, if you can wedge something between those two, 
then you can control them because they're, they're trying to get back. And if you can put a wedge between them and confuse them, you can manipulate them and extract value, extract energy, extract resources, time, money. And so I see, I see a lot of that being a societal challenge that we're going through right now is the destruction of the family, the destruction of the masculine and feminine in a healthy, mature way, and getting people just to attack each other. Because then you can't find healing, you can't find unity. And that is where we're really powerful and strong. So obviously, if you're trying to take advantage of people, you don't want that. <laughs> so they can only be done if we're not in tune with our own hearts and dealing with our own stuff internally. If we do that, they can't manipulate us because we got no wounds to unconsciously control by poking and prodding. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. It does. Um, and I think to um, now, like what I've um, seen is that I feel like a lot of people, like the things that make them uncomfortable, they look at it as a toxic trait instead of looking internal. I think that's what kind of what you were saying anyway, um, and fixing those things. But also social media has played such a huge role like um, in the way everything is viewed and controlled as well. Obviously, you know, you can you can uh, you can choose who to follow. You can choose who not to follow. But I mean, ultimately, you can see everything on social media. So how important do you think it is to and I know you kind of have broached this a little bit um, recently where you said you wanted to be more present in your life, not spend so much time on social media. How important do you think it is for people to step away from social media and to actually be present in their lives and in their communities and build those relationships? I think we've reached a saturation point with social media where it's, it's, um, it's like you can't, you, the clothes can't get any wetter. And so people keep pouring water on thinking that there's more in there. And I think uh, what you just said, or you alluded to about being active in your community is what is, I feel, society, and just I'll speak for myself, what I feel being called to be, uh, play a bigger role in. Um, I think this technology and the ability to connect and share ideas is fantastic. And I think uh, there's great value in that. And we're, we're learning where, what it now feels to be oversaturated with it. Um, I don't think it'll go away entirely. I think it'll, it'll just find a better balance. And I think um, finding that harmony with putting out content, creating you know, social media posts and seeing things online, but then balancing it with a, an actual active involvement in your community, with people, with friends, I think that'll find a better balance and equilibrium uh, over time. And I think there'll be other people that won't because they don't want to do that work or they, they feel more comfortable being angry and aggressive and, and unconscious about their wounds and what's going on internally. Uh, eventually they'll have to learn the lesson because that's how I see life working is that you don't get to avoid anything. And eventually you'll have to learn it in this lifetime or the next. So, um, yeah, I think it's important. Um, and I think everybody will find that balance for themselves and how they want to work with that. Um, it's become the channel surfing, you know, the, back in the day, you'd see the movies of the big guy on the couch and he would just be channel surfing, eating popcorn and we're like, Oh, I'll never be that guy. But yet we're sitting there on our phone, you know, basically channel surfing by swiping and eating popcorn or whatever. So it's, um, it's, it's the, just the latest form of, of couch potato. Um, they just found new ways to do it. So I think they'll, that's coming. I think that more, more people will, will recognize that. Uh, and I think all in good time, people will, will shift their behaviors to a more balanced state of creation uh, and also healthy consumption, whether it be social media or TV or movies or any sort of content. Okay. My final question for you is, um, have you considered, um, politics in the future? Because I know like right now in the world, um, Everyone seems to be looking to have like one specific person. I know, uh, you know, I know Justin Trudeau is not popular in Canada and, you know, a lot of people in the U.S. are looking to Trump. And but if people don't get involved in the lower levels of government, we're not going to fix those higher levels of government. And I and a lot of people have lost sight of that, that the people, the higher people in power really don't have the power until the lower levels of government are in there. So I was wondering, I know I've asked you and I know other people have asked you, would you consider being in government? Have you thought about that more? And if you were, 
what what impact would you want to have? My thing has always been, um, given the gifts that I've been blessed with and what I feel I'm called to do, I will do it. Uh, if I felt it at some point that that would be the best place to put my time and energy to serve people and grow and give the most, then yes, I would do that. I'm not necessarily like, oh yeah, I've always wanted to be in politics. <laughs> um, I, I see, I see right now at this point in my life, the biggest value that I feel called and drawn to is the conversations and the stories and the experiences that I want to share. Because I believe that if I can have these conversations with people and come to a place of pointing to wor- towards where the real work begins, then that will automatically shift the conversations and the politics and the people and the, the laws and how we organize because we're coming from a place of peace from our hearts as opposed to aggression and, and trauma and upset, which then wants us to elect this person to justify all the pain that we felt because they're going to attack this person who we've been scared and told to hate. So I agree with you that it has to start at the local level. And to me, the most local you can get is internal. <laughs> so I guess in a way I'm, I'm doing that because I feel that to me is, is the birthplace of the experience of being alive. And so I love to talk about these things, to explore this, to learn about it, to learn from others, to do my own work, and then to have these conversations with people and create experiences uh, to hopefully generate inspiration or conversation, insight into people's lives that they can then translate into a more meaningful experience and therefore in their community and in their political structures. Um, I I actually would like, there's some, some countries, I can't remember the one off the top of my head. I just remember seeing a photo of a man who was a president of a country and he lived in a a beautiful little small house, very humble and wasn't extravagant. And just, it was kind of like a, kind of like a desk job. Like he was just taking care of the things that he was supposed to take care of, but he wasn't famous and he wasn't like, you know, doing all this stuff, trying to be this, you know, big, powerful leader. And I was like, yeah, I kind of feel like that's how politics should be. It's just kind of like, it's kind of like the condo board. It's kind of like you get the stuff done, you get the things handled and, you know, contingency fund for the leaking roof and you fix this and you have conversations once a month about the things that need to be fixed and, and you uh, have a vision for the future and, and you keep the morale up. <laughs> um, obviously, I have no idea about politics and I'm sure there's a lot more to it. Um, but I've always liked that idea of a simple, a simple process. And I think personally, the way the world is moving. I had a great conversation with two friends last night, four hours about the way the world is moving. And that's one of the things that I think we all agreed on was this idea of decentralization and a move away from this sort of top down power structure that's been around forever um, to having more empowered local communities and people and that being the future. And I think that's coming. And I think this sort of idea of a, smaller government type thing guy living in his house, very humble home. I think that's probably what we're going to see more of in the future as these big archaic systems of governance and power collapse because of new technologies and new ways of organizing ourselves and the freely exchanged information now that we have on the internet. Um, We're going to see some big changes and we have the opportunity to participate in those right now. And that would be what I would want to engage people with, not necessarily being a political figure and being like touring around the country and, you know, being a leader in that sense, but more so uh, touring around the country and, and um, celebrating and documenting and sharing the growth and, and uh, progression of these individual communities that are strong and secure and uh, aligned with a, a vision of self-empowerment and self-sufficiency and, you know, good, good values like that. Um, uh, I see that being something more so of what I'm aligned with versus like prime minister or, you know, premier of a province. Um, while I see those roles now being the system that we have, I, I, I'm much more interested in the future of localized, smaller, decentralized governing bodies of, of communities of people that collectively work together in agreement, um, and have more power over their own affairs. Yeah. Thank you so much, Graham. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's what I feel. (laughs) It does. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time greatly. Um, Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Laurie. Always a pleasure. Thank you for the fun questions.